the extremities starting with lower limbs. I've got some pictures there, uh, some models of the textbook algae study. The pelvis, um, well, really, I want to get to the lower limb, but we kind of start inside the abdominal cavity. Like a picture like this, you can see that the artery that has emerged through the diaphragm, now it's called abdominal aorta. The abdominal aorta runs kind of, well, if you look at the two tubes, is the artery on the left or on the right? It's a little bit on the left of the vertebral column. The vein is on the right. That's the inferior vena cava. So. Uh, or top. A little bit on the left. I mean, look at these two big tubes. Abdominal aorta, inferior vena cava. A little bit on the right. Which one's longer? The red tube or the blue tube? The blue tube is longer. It forms from the common iliac arteries. They usually form right around there. That's about, you can't tell, that's about the level of L5. So when the blood runs up, forms at about the level of L5. It runs all the way up to its uh, whole diagram, way up here. Um, that's about the level of T8. Blood's going up. And in the aorta, blood's coming down. Okay, that's about the level of T12. And it runs all the way, you know, close to the end right there. That's about L4. So usually books are saying this artery runs from the level of there to there, from T12 to L4. And so, you know, it's shorter because its hole in the, in the diaphragm is lower. So, but basically, the abdominal order ends by bifurcating into the, let's follow the arteries, abdominal aorta. Runs from the level of T12 down to around L4. It's going to bifurcate into two common iliac. artery on the right, and you have another one on the left. Okay. So the common iliac will then divide into internal and external. So I'll leave a little opening there. Continue it on down. Um, so the one that enters the pelvis is the internal iliac artery. I, I'm going to drop right. Just call it internal iliac. That artery enters the pelvis. The other one that continues on is the external iliac. And it'll continue out of the pelvis, and it'll squeeze out of the pelvis under the inguinal ligament. Change, but it continues on, and the name changes from external iliac to femoral artery. It's basically squeezing out the pelvis in the front, so, and that's how your lower your lower limb gets blood supply from the from the anterior aspect. <coughs> so it just continues on. As 
the femoral artery. And it's the same on the other side, I just won't draw it. So basically, just to review, you start with abdominal aorta, You have this little bifurcation. Well, it's not a little one, but you have the common iliac after the bifurcation. And then the common iliac will divide into internal and external. The external continues as the femoral artery as it squeezes it out, out the pelvis on the front side. The femoral artery is where you can have another pulse in your groin area. The internal iliac, uh, well, it enters the pelvis. The external iliac does not enter the pelvis. It continues out of the pelvis. There are other arteries that enter the pelvis besides the two internal iliacs. There's a little artery that comes off here. That's the uh, mid I'll point to it here. Median sacral. Median sacral artery. skin deep and palpate that artery. There's another artery up here. This is the inferior mesenteric. But it's actually, they cut it off, but it's actually going to enter the pelvis and supply blood to the rectum. And you see the little branch coming off, abdominal aorta. And as it comes off the abdominal aorta, it is the inferior mesenteric artery. Where you um, inferior mesenteric artery, well, let me talk about this. This artery is important for blood supply to the distal colon. I'll really teach that when I get to the digestive viscera at the end of the course. But for now, for this class, I want you to know this inferior mesenteric artery, it'll continue on into the pelvis and supply blood to the rectum. So I'm going to draw it going into the pelvis to the rectum. It continues on. And it changes its name when it gets to the rectum to superior rectal artery. So the name of the artery tells you what it supplies blood to in that case. Superior rectal artery. So let's keep track of all the arteries here. Let's just talk about the ones that entered the pelvis. Internal iliac artery, that enters the pelvis. Now, how many do you have? Two. So that's two arteries that enter the pelvis. Here's median sacral artery. That's a single. That's three. Here's superior rectal artery that enters the pelvis. Here we're up to four. And for males, that's it. Okay. Now, for females, it's different. Because remember where the ovaries are? Well, they're not in the scrotum. That's for males. So in the males, the gonadal artery goes through the, you know, the uh, inguinal canal and down, it never enters the pelvis. But for females, the gonadal arteries do enter the pelvis. Not shown here because it's not a female. But um, for females, it would be six because of the gonadal. And um, you should know that, the gonadal artery. You're already supposed to know the gonadal artery from a repro, I guess. Here's another picture. So those iliac vessels can be confusing for students because you got the common, and you got the external, and then you got the internal. Okay, that's that's three. You're up to three, and they're all iliac arteries. Um, one thing that's helped me: the ureter it crosses the iliac vessels right where they bifurcate from common to internal to external. That's always helped me identify them. You write that down. Now the ureter. Is its function is to carry urine from kidney to bladder, but here I'm using it as a landmark to help you identify iliac vessels. Ureters, I should say plural because you got two of them. Ureters cross iliac vessels, just distal. where the 
common iliac bifurcates into external slash internal iliac. Okay. Now there's arteries and veins, and they all have the same name. Uh, and, uh, we are responsible for both the arteries and the veins. Okay, so that's why this is a model in the room, and the other one's a picture from the book. Um, other things about the pelvis that can be useful in identifying the blood vessels. Um, one thing are the ligaments of the pelvis, and let's see if you're awake this morning. Is that the front or the back? It's the back. It's posterior. Very good. We're awake. And so we know that the femoral artery will squeeze out the front to supply blood to the lower limb. Then you have some blood, blood vessels that squeeze out the back. Okay. And so these ligaments can be used to help identify things that exit the pelvis posteriorly. Now I want you to know, um, let me see if I can do this. See this honking huge one right there? It's like this whole thing. whole thing is one big ligament. It's called the um, sacrotuberous ligament. That whole thing from up here all the way down there. I want you to know that ligament. So I'm going to erase this. I'll write it on the board. Do you remember studying the ischium? It's like you have like the Ischial tuberosity, you called it your sit bone. Wait, wait, there's a big ligament attached there. Uh, Sacrotuberous ligament. So, posterior pelvis. right here, I'll use a different color, it's right there, I don't know if you can see it, it's the sacrospinous ligament, sacrotuberous ligament, sacrospinous ligament, be able to know those, those, those will kind of help you identify some things. There's something called the, the sciatic foramina, because those ligaments create spaces for things to come out the back. Here's a side view. Here's our sacrotuberous ligament. Here's our sacrospinous ligament. And then the spaces colored yellow and colored blue, well, they're called the, the sciatic foramina. Spaces, you said? Well, see the blue and the yellow? Yeah. Those are both spaces, and we call them the sciatic foramina. Okay. So I guess to be specific, the yellow space is called the greater sciatic foramina. And then the, um, the yellow space. Well, when I say yellow, I mean, I'll put yellow here. I'm referring to the figure. The blue space is the lesser sciatic parameter. So I want to, you know, those spaces. So those ligaments create these spaces. I'll just say, so these ligaments form the sciatic foramina. And those are the spaces, particularly this one, the greater, focus on it. It's how blood vessels squeeze out the back to supply blood to the gluteal region and other regions. Okay. 
So if you're going to study the lower limb, you're going to study how the blood vessels exit the pelvis. Because the artery is in the body cavity, the abdominal aorta. So here's a blank picture. Now there's one thing coming out of there that you should know. This muscle is the piriformis. Okay. And the piriformis well, it occupies most of that space exiting the pelvis, the greater sciatic foramina. And so blood vessels are forced to squeeze out above or below it. Okay. So no, the piriformis in the pelvis is kind of a landmark muscle. So what I want to do is um, go back to the internal iliac artery and talk about the arteries that don't exit the pelvis first before I talk about all the other ones. Now this figure from the atlas has all the branches of the internal iliac artery. And you don't have to know them all, lucky for you. There's a couple of branches of the internal iliac artery that are on there. Let's, let's follow it backwards. The artery is the abdominal aorta. It's right there. It branches into two common iliacs. They, they, they illustrate the right one. Follow the right one down. It goes to the internal iliac and then the external iliac, and that just goes all the way down. There's our um, another landmark, the inguinal ligament. I always kind of have you write that one down because that's where the name changes, right? From external iliac, you cross it, then what do you call it? The femoral, so you can take the pulse in the, in the front of your groin. Okay, let's go back to the internal iliac, and notice that it has all these big branches. And they, there are these two big branches here, they call it the anterior and the posterior division. Like this one right there. Anterior division. And this one right there. Posterior division. So how I would categorize the branches of the internal iliac are by the divisions. Think of the divisions as big branches. So you have the internal iliac. The internal iliac artery branches, anterior division. division. All right, one artery for the anterior division. Um, there's numbers here, not names, but that, that one right there. That's the um, umbilical artery right there. It's label number four here. This one coming off right there and actually exiting the pelvis and it's going to supply blood to your big thigh muscles, the adductors, number five. That is the obturator artery. to the posterior division, right there, there's an artery coming off, and it's exiting the piriformis superiorly. It's the superior gluteal artery, it's number two. And superior is a relative term. Superior to what? The piriformis, right? That's our landmark muscle. Gluteal tells you the region it's going to, so it's exiting the pelvis going out the backside. Everyone, everyone knows gluteal means the butt, right? 
school. Well, you got one down there. If that's the superior gluteal artery, what's that one? Inferior. The inferior gluteal artery. You know that. This one's pretty important. That's the uh, inferior one. Another one that exits inferior to the um, piriformis and goes on, you can't really tell from this picture, it's going to go on to supply blood to the perineal region where your external genitalia are. That's the pudendal artery. It is, it's down there. Yeah, I guess you could call it number eight. But I'm not sure if it refers to one of these. So I'm just going to call it pudendal, this one. That's all, all the ones you should study. I have recently updated the study guides for this test, and I crossed a few off. Okay. And so you want to look for the study guides with the moniker SU19. That's summer 19. And I crossed a few off. And so what I did was I literally just put strike through. So for those of you that printed out the old version, the old ones are not there, you'll know. I, I, them off, it's pretty obvious. And so I'm sure you don't mind when I do that. No. So for the lab and the lecture study guide, uh, look for those to see what I crossed. It was just a few, 99% the same, but I did cross a few off. And it was from this region. So that's why I'm mentioning it now. There's a blank figure you can study. There's another figure you can study with the viscera in it, which is the ones that got on the board, the internal iliac. Things I uh, know that here's a model in the room that kind of has it. Remember studying that for repro? You, you could study it for um, like for example when you're studying. Oh, there's my landmark. That's ureter. Now if that's the ureter. What's the artery up here? Common iliac. So then it crosses right there. That's the external iliac artery and vein. So there's my internal iliac. And see, I, I can see all the branches there. Like, for example, well, I, I've studied this a lot. Now. That's the superior empirical teal artery. That's pudendal. And that's octator. And you can study it. Okay. Now, the iliac vessels are highly variable. Like, for example, I took a picture of this one. And it's a little different from your books, and it's not because it's wrong, it's because in anatomy, it's just different in different people. And so I, I kind of like label it for you, and the ones you had to know, key it out for you for, for that one. So this model, in case you didn't know, it's that big dark guy standing in the back of the room with a dark nystrom torso model. Um, so that has some of those iliac arteries in it too. I want to move on to the gluteal region. And I want to talk about superior and inferior gluteal arteries and veins, looking at it from the posterior view. So I took a few pictures from the atlas and I put them all side by side and give page numbers. In a superficial dissection, you can't see the arteries. You have to re remove. What you do is you kind of cut right here, and then you, you're able to reflect back and see our landmark. That is the piriformis. Okay. So what you're supposed to notice is, well, based on what's on the board, I mean, well, if I point to this artery up there, and that's my landmark, what is that? Superior gluteal artery. That one's the inferior. I'm not sure if we can see pudendal. I think that's pudendal right there. Anyways, so notice that it's not just the artery. It's like, like here and here, you have the superior gluteal um, artery, but you also have the, the vein and the nerve, and they're all bundled together. So sometimes um, I refer to the whole thing as just, I'll just call it superior gluteal nerve artery vein bundle. I'll just put NAV bundle sometimes. So I'm just referring to all three structures at once. Okay. They all have the same name, NAV bundle. 
I think that might be under study by A and A plus one null. For nerve, artery, and nerve. So that's three structures. Inferior gluteal, nerve, artery, vein. So it's like, it's like a three for one. And use the piriformis as a landmark. And um, I usually don't ask you to identify nerves on the blood vessel practical, but you should know that nerve, sciatic. It's the biggest nerve of the body. It's about the width of your thumb. So if I show you like this model in the room, the muscle leg, and you can identify your landmark, which is right here, my piriformis muscle. Therefore, that's the superior, that's the inferior gluteal artery. That's sciatic. All right, so I'm going to move on. Um, one of the branches that I taught that's still on the board is the umbilical <laughs> artery. And I finally um, am able to teach fetal circulation because I finally mentioned the umbilical artery. And you finally had enough cardio that you know adult circulation so we can now compare it to fetal circulation. This is actually back in the heart chapter. But I teach it now because I don't like to teach fetal circulation so you've had a test on, uh, on the heart, at least. Okay. So here's the figure that compares fetal versus adult circulation. And the big difference is how blood flow in the fetus can bypass the lungs and the liver. The lungs are primarily for breathing. And as you well know, that the fetus is in a big water sac. It's literally underwater. So it's not breathing. So you can kind of bypass the lungs in terms of pulmonary circulation. You still need blood supply for development, but not for pulmonary circulation. Now the liver is primarily for digestion, but it's receiving all the nutrient-rich blood from mom. So mom is doing the digestion for baby. So you can largely bypass the liver. So that's kind of what we teach when we emphasize fetal circulation. I would know two lung bypasses in fetal circulation. Two lung bypasses means the pulmonary circulation will skip the lungs, basically. But you already know one of them, the ligamentum arteriosum. We talked about that. Now, now, I'm going to point to it. It's way up here. Now, in fetal circulation, when it's open, it's called the ductus arteriosus. Think of it as a blood vessel that is a very short one. It connects pulmonary trunk to aortic arch. arteriosus connects those two. Think about blood flow. Blood flows from the pulmonary trunk to the pulmonary arteries to the lungs. However, if you have a, a bypass, you go straight from the trunk to the arch, don't you skip the lungs? So that's considered a lungs bypass. Okay? And so when it closes, well, it's open in fetal circulation. And it closes when baby takes uh, first breath, when the lungs inflate with air for the first time. Okay. Now, why does that happen? Because when baby's in water, the lungs are filled with water. And a fluid, a fluid filled lungs provide a lot more resistance to blood flow. So blood always just flows down the path of least resistance. So in fetal circulation, there's too much resistance for, for pulmonary circulation for blood to flow to it. So it naturally wants to go from straight from pulmonary trunk to aortic arch. There's less resistance there. Baby takes first breath. Baby cries in the room. You hear it. It's, it's always a good sound, right, when baby cries. And if, now the lungs are filled with air. Air provides less resistance. Now blood will preferentially want to flow through 
to the lungs. And that closes. Ligament of arteriosus. Now, the ductus arteriosus closes, and you call it ligamentum arteriosum is the adult structure. That's why you can have underwater births. Oh, well, you know, it's kind of scary. Well, he can't breathe. Well, he hasn't been breathing. You know, so just take his first breath a second later and you bring the baby up. Um, there's another bypass of the lungs. You go straight from RA to LA. There's a little hole in there. You're studying it as fossil valves. In fetal circulation, when it's open, it's more like a valve, and it's called the foramen ovale. Anyways, it's a it's a hole, it's a valve-like hole in the septum between RA right atrium, LA left atrium. So basically, think about it. You go straight from right heart to left heart. You skip the lungs, right? So, and again, when baby takes first breath, um, there's less resistance in the lung. So instead of going from RA to LA, it's better to go down to the right ventricle up the pulmonary trunk, okay? And um, when it closes, that flap closes and becomes the fossa ovalis. So over here, it closes. All right. Um, so literally, the bypasses are this and that, the two lung bypasses. You have well, one liver bypass. The liver bypass is shown right here. You go from umbilical veins. How many umbilical veins? One or two. You got the one. How many umbilical arteries? You got the two. Okay. So anyways, so one umbilical vein, going back, going back, that's got all the nutrient-rich blood, oxygen-rich blood. It gets there. It's going to bypass um, the liver and go through the ductus venosus straight to the inferior vena cava, therefore bypassing the liver. So the bypass is ductus spinosus. Got one umbilical vein, it goes straight to inferior vena cava. The ductus spinosus allows you to go straight from there to there. And in doing that, you're bypassing the liver. Okay. Now, you do have two umbilical arteries. And today, what I taught you is those are both branches off the internal iliac anterior division. So they're not part of the whole bypass thing. So I'm just writing that what you already know, that they branch off internal iliac.
And that's shown right there. When they close up, they're just ligaments. They're open, call umbilical arteries, but then they form nice ligaments when they're closed in adults. Medial umbilical ligaments. Close, and they're called medial okay, and that's it for the fetal circulation. Primarily, two lungs bypasses, one liver bypass. We're gonna move on to the rectum. The rectum. Well, there was one artery you had to know. That was the superior rectal artery. There's, there's middle and there's also inferior, but I kind of crossed those off. The only one you had to know, it's going to be on the test, is know that the inferior mesenteric continues on as superior rectal artery. So I, that's the one I drew on the board earlier. So if I tag it like up here, if it's close to the abdominal aorta, call it inferior mesenteric. It's going to give off a lot of branches to the distal colon, but when it gets way down here, call it superior rectal artery. So let me write that on the board. Once again, I do believe it's a study guide question. So this picture can, can kind of help you see that, okay? And um, write that in your notes, associated with this picture. We do have superior rectal artery on models, and so if you kind of find um, the viscera here, it's shown, well, I kind of point up here, but it it's really it goes all the way down there. So up there, it's the inferior mesenteric. Here, what did I call it? Very good. Down here or here, it's the uh, superior rectal artery. Okay, that, that's kind of just the one you got to know for the rectum. So. Um, So we did kind of fetal circulation, we did pelvis, we did a lot of things. I'm going to go back to the front of the thigh. So we learned how two arteries kind of squeeze out the back, superior, inferior rectal artery, as well as pudendal, I should say. Now let's go back to the front. The external iliac continues on um, as femoral. There's one red vessel here. It's the femoral. Can you see it? It's that leg right back there, just right here. Now, this is an important region. I said you could have a pulse there, you could feel it. These structures are bounded by what's called the femoral triangle. Although the ligament's not there. Well, let me tell you what I mean by the femoral triangle. I'll try to use or oh, grab a better picture. Let's let's get to from here and let's go to here. Um, when you dissect the lower extremity and you remove only the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, there's this big, thick biological spandex. I call it. It's the fascia. Okay, it's the fascia lata in the thigh. It's all the gray tissue. It's over the muscles, the deep fascia of the lower extremity. There's a little hole right there. So 
right there. It's called the saphenous opening. The longest blood vessel in the body is the great saphenous vein. It starts from the inside of the foot and it runs all the way up the medial aspect of the lower limb. And it drains blood into the femoral vein right through that opening. So that vein is on your study guide. The great saphenous vein. So look for it, medial lower limb. Professor, it's a PJ, it's not just a PH. It's so cute. Oh, I think yeah, I, that's a misspelling. Okay. Here. Yeah, I should correct that. It's PH. Saphenous PH yeah. sound. Okay, great saphenous vein, long vein of the body. There's also a small saphenous vein, we'll, we'll get to that. But anyways. It's the whole lower limb it's running up there. I'm going to say it drains into the moral vein. Okay. It's got to get through that saphenous opening. So this opening here is the saphenous opening. So that's the great saphenous vein, and that's the femoral vein. And you should know that because, um, well, now let's remove the fascia lata and get down to the muscle. You can see the same thing here as here. The great saphenous vein has been cut. So it was cut there. So there it is, uncut there. So that's the femoral vein next to the artery, next to the nerve. And the femoral triangle is the inguinal ligament bounded by sartorius and this muscle here, the adductor longus. The formal triangle is pretty easy. So know the triangle, know the borders and contents. Borders, like I said, laterally it's sartorius, medially it's ductor longus. The base of the triangle is the inguinal ligament, and that's the anatomy. Those are the borders. Let's label them. Sartorius, using that picture as a reference, it's on this side. On this side, medially adductor longus. And this one here. We don't look at it. Now the contents has the pain thing. This is for blood vessels. It goes from lateral to medial femoral nerve artery and vein. Lateral to medial, femoral, and a V. Pictures are easy because it's like yellow, red, and blue. Okay, really on a cadaver, nerves are kind of whitish. They feel like cords, and blood vessels feel like tubes, but. Like I said, arteries are more whitish and veins are more grayish. So nerve artery and vein from lateral to medial on either side. And so the contents and the borders, and we have models that kind of show that this region, they don't show it exactly like um, pictures do, but they're there. Now if you follow the, the femoral artery down the leg, it gives off many branches. And there's one you gotta know. Um, this one right here is the deep femoral the deep femoral. Now they call it profunda femoris. Okay. But it's um, more commonly known as the deep femoral.
So think of the femoral artery as a continuation of external iliac artery. There's the external iliac. It just crosses the inguinal ligament, then you call it femoral. What I usually do is I just look for the femoral head. Then I know it's femoral. Call the artery, femoral artery. And it passes by femoral head. Because, you know, they don't always show the inguinal ligament. The question becomes, well, when do I call it? Femoral when it passes by femoral head. That's a pretty safe rule. One branch, deep femoral. Okay, this book calls it profunda femoral, same thing. When someone is profound, uh, well, that's really deep, yeah, that's where the name comes from. So the, most people just call it the deep femoral, and that's fine. Notice how the deep femoral artery gives off a couple of branches that wrap around the neck of the, fe um, the, neck of the femur. It's the medial and the lateral circumflex femoral. So it's kind of like a two for one. They, they form an anastomosis but you call them two different things as they branch off of the deep femoral. So under here, I'm going to write medial circumflex femoral. And the other one, lateral circumflex femoral. Branches you gotta know. Okay. Uh, kept it kind of simple. Alright, so the main artery is in the front. It has to get to the back of the leg. You don't want a major artery going over the top of your knee. That's a dangerous spot for it. What it does to get to the front and go to the back, it starts to do that right here. The femoral artery goes through what's called the um, adductor canal. Let me advance the slide. It's right there. There's your kneecap. And you want to know how the artery goes from the front to the back. There it is, going through adductor canal. It's going to pass through the adductor hiatus. Yeah. Now it's in the back of the knee. And the name changes from femoral to popliteal. Is it still deep femoral up there? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, it's out of the picture. But is it still called right here? Is it called femoral? Or no. So here's femoral. Uh -huh. The deep femoral oh, is right so there. The other side. Okay. Yeah, and it's no, I'm not talking about that one anymore. I'm okay. just now I'm going back to the femoral. Regular. I'm calling about that. Okay. So let's kind of keep track of this. Here. Starts with the abdominal aorta. So that first branch, what do you call it? Common iliac artery. Hope that's what you I think I would say that. Then the common iliac will branch into yeah, the internal and the external iliac, so uh, internal iliac artery, external iliac, iliac artery. So the 
confusing thing is the name changes, not the artery. The external iliac, it'll continue on, go out the pelvis. It crosses our landmark. Which ligament? Inguinal. And it continues on as femoral. one branch coming off of it, the deep femoral and medial lateral circumflex, I'll just keep it to the deep. You can also call it the profunda femoris. Anyways, I'm following femoral all the way down, and it's going through um, a hiatus. Adductor hiatus, it's a space. It's between the tendon of adductor magnus. Anyways, this is how the artery gets from the front to the back. Once it passes through there, it's going to go to the back of the knee. Then you call it six, popliteal. Or popliteal, take your pick. popliteal artery named for the same region. The back of the knee is the popliteal region. The front of the knee is the patellar region. Okay. Well, anyways, that's kind of where we are now. So that's this picture. Major artery on the back of the knee, not the front. So here's kind of the same thing. Um, at the back of the knee, there's going to be another division. So let's kind of look at the back of the knee there. Here's the back of the knee. I always look for those knobby condyles. I know I'm posterior. So there's the adductor hiatus, and here's the artery passes through. Now you call it popliteal. Okay, here is a major branch where the popliteal will branch into the posterior tibial and the anterior tibial. Okay. that picture, this is from the front, I want to erase this here. So now we're on the back of the knee, it's popliteal. And when it branches, the one that stays posterior, simply call it posterior tibial. goes to the front anterior tibial artery. Notice today I'm not using the coloring plates, but I did give you the coloring plates. I'm just not doing it in the lecture. I did it for head and neck so you could see how coloring may or may not be an effective study tool for you. If you want to color, you color during lab. Just do it on your own. Anyways, don't confuse this one for that one. The fibular artery is not on your study guide, but the anterior tibial is. Yeah, so if you look for the anterior tibial on the anterior aspect, you have to remove a muscle. The tibialis anterior, I believe, is the one you got to remove. Well, anyways, remove that. You can see the artery in the front. On the picture, here it is. It kind of squeezes through the tip fit proximally through the interosseous membrane. And you got it right there, the anterior uh, tibial artery. So those are the only two branches you got to know. You could follow those all the way down to the foot, and then you're done. Okay, I don't, I don't do any, anything else. Um, I'm going to go back up to the back of the knee because we do have models that show it. I took a picture of one. Um, so if this is the popliteal region, 
identify the red tube. Poplineal artery. Poplineal vein. They're a sciatic nerve. I mean, it branches into the tibial and common fibula. You don't have to know the nerves for this test, but they're easy to identify. So I just kind of have them labeled. I'm not going to ask you to identify nerves on the test. I just kind of listed them because they're there. The one that's tibial, that's common fibula. Don't worry about it. Worry about the blood vessels. This is the region we're talking about, the back of the knee. Popliteal artery and vein right there. That's what you got to know. That's easy, I think. All right? Look to where they terminate. So I kind of point to it. You can barely see it. Anterior, posterior, tibial. And you can't tell which is which. You, you got to follow it. So if you see that one, and you're on the back of the calf there, which one is it? Posterior tibial. Okay. So just kind of orient yourself. If it's the back or if it's the front. Um, so again, follow those all the way down to the foot, and you're done with lower limb. So to switch to upper limb, um, let's start with the most proximal part of the upper limb, the shoulder. Here's a picture of a model. We got a bunch of them, all those vascular arms. They show a lot of blood vessels, so let me take you through that. Let me first, I think most people know what the, the shoulder is. Let me define the axilla, the arm. There's a guy with an um, arm abducted. You have to abduct the arm to see the armpit. When the arm is abducted in the anatomical position, you can't see it. Okay? But with the arm abducted, you can kind of see all of these boundaries and, well, you don't, I'm not going to have you like, I'm not going to drill you on the axilla, but you should know these, like this muscle right there, like lats and teres major, okay? these big muscles in there, um, what's in there? Pec muscles, right? Your pecs, people know this. Um, hairy armpit, lateral wall, <laughs> the artery is going to be like right in there, okay, right in there. That's called actually um, the medial bicipital meats, all right? So the things I would note if you're studying the armpit and you're studying blood vessel, I would note the teres major because that is where um, the artery name changes. Um, that would note medial bicipital groove. I'm going to give some on this picture. That groove for the biceps is, that's where you find an artery. It's going to be the brachial artery. And the other thing I had you note know was the inferior border of teres major. You're going to have name change when the artery crosses that muscle. It's going to change from axillary to brachial. Axillary artery becomes brachial artery. The artery doesn't change, just the name, because you're entering a different region. OK, anyways, <coughs> let's look at the shoulder. So when the arm is adducted, we can't really study the axilla. But this picture and that picture of the model shows one important vein that runs in the deltopectoral group. It's called cephalic vein. Uh, so, no doubt. So, in the shoulder region, okay, deltopectoral groove. In it lies cephalic vein. I haven't figured out why it's called cephalic, because cephalic means head, and we're in the shoulder region, but we'll just go with it. And the reason why I point this out in lecture is students always want to call it axillary vein, but it's not. You can't even see the axilla when the arm is 
a duct in, so don't confuse it with axillary vein, it's cephalic vein. The deltal pectoral groove is just the space between delts and pecs. Pecs, delts. So there it is, right there. Right where? I'm telling you, someone's going to call it axillary vein. Don't do it. May it not be you. Cephalic vein. So here's another picture of the axilla. We have some dissection here. And this is um, showing us just the axillary artery, where it begins, where it ends. Call it the limits. first branch that comes off aortic arch, that first big one, brachiocephalic trunk. We call it trunk, it's an artery, but that's going to branch into subclavian artery and common carotid artery. or the subclavian, the one I drew, number two. Wow. Going up to the head, common karate. We're doing the right side, but I'm not going to put right every time. On the left practical, how do you know if you're going to put right or left? I actually tell you, put right or left. And I only do it a few times. You don't have to put right or left every single time. The mistake? This actually occurs, I say identify. Be sure to put right or left. Students will just put, oh, they just put right or left. And they don't name the artery, forget that part. Um, so only put right or left if you have to, of course, name the artery, all right, or the vein, whatever it is. Common carotid artery, okay, this one is. Subclavian artery, what region is that? Neck. So you made it out of your chest into the neck. Now you gotta get out of the neck into the arm. Right? So let's see right here. Which rib is that? You got 12. Which one is that? That's the first one. When the artery passes the lateral border of the first rib, the name changes from subclavian to axillary. So I'm going to draw first rib. And the artery passes by it. Subclavian artery becomes axillary artery. Then it continues down. 
tail, look for the scapula. See the scapula back there? And uh, I kind of eyeballed it and I put this line right here. Uh, that is the inferior border of the Terry's Major, uh, where is it? I don't even have it, but that's last, so I know it's right there. Anyways, okay, let me just put a border. Let's say that's the inferior border of Terry's Major. changes from axillary to brachial. Well, let's keep going. The terminal branches of the brachial artery, you can get to the crook of the elbow, about an inch past the crook of the elbow, um, it branches into Radial ulnar. That bifurcation right here, what we say is that bifurcation occurs an inch past the ACF, the antecubital fossa, the crook of your elbow. ACF stands for antecubital fossa. Draw blood, right? There's a vein in there that draw blood. They don't do it from the artery. Uh, well, anyways, that's the basic. So the confusing thing in anatomy is the name of the artery keeps changing, and we expect students to know where the name changes are. So take it all the way back to subclavian, the first landmark, lateral border, first rib. You go from subclavian to axillary. The axillary becomes brachial at the inferior, inferior border. Terry's major. That goes down the medial aspect of the arm. You get past an inch past the crook of the elbow, then it's um, the terminal branches. Radial and ulna. Right, so there's always details. Well, let's always like make sure you get all the details here. So go back to this slide. I say limits. What if I wanted you to define where it begins? What would you say? This is the axillary. Where does it become axillary? When you pass the ladder board, the first rib, you can't see the rib there, but I had to point somewhere on this figure. Now, I, I specifically pointed to where it ends. What is that? Muscle. Inferior border of teres major, where axillary will then become brachial. Okay. Another detail, you can use the pectoralis minor as a landmark to divide the axillary artery into three parts. I'm going to erase this now. So that's the coracoid process, that's ribs three, four, and five. Those are the uh, attachments for pec minor.
coracoid process, the bird beaks of scapula, the muscle can go more or less like that. Ribs, three to five. Wait, wait, the muscle is pectoralis minor. It divides axillary artery into three parts. Let's just go first, second, third part. There's the axillary artery. The part that's kind of medial to the pec minor is the first part, right? Medial. Medial to what? To pectoralis minor. The part that's underneath it let's call that the second part. It's deep to the pectoralis minor. The third part is lateral to it. And the third part well, all parts have branches. The third part has the branches that are on your study list. There's three. The, just remember this. The third part has three branches. The third three. There's medial lateral circumflex humoral. And then there's subscapular. Okay. They're listed here in that point to them. Now, what I don't like about this picture is they show, they usually form a lasso around it, but they, um, they show them not connected. I don't like that. Okay. All right, so what I was saying is. Um, This one it usually connects to that one. Okay, so this one coming off right there, it crosses over the front. So it's called the anterior circumflex femoral. Okay. Let's call this number one. So the third part has three branches, one branch, anterior. Circumflex numeral artery. There's a branch, second branch, number two, right there. It's coming off and it's going behind the humerus, the neck of the, the surgical neck of the humerus. It's called the posterior circumflex humeral, and it connects to the anterior one. form a loop. And uh, look for it on our models. It is shown nice. And so basically, what bone is that that they're wrapping around? Just name the bone. What's the bone of the arm? You got one bone in your arm. Humerus. Now, what's that region? We call that the surgical neck. Remember that? Usually, things are prone to fracture. You got a big knob, and it, and it narrows into a neck. And where it narrows is where bones are prone to fracture. So you have two necks. This one right there, that's the anatomical neck. Because it, it, in anatomy, it always goes head to neck. Like, I have a head, this is my neck. Head, neck. However, there's a second neck here where it narrows. Surgical neck, because it's prone to fracture. And we're worried about that, because you've got these blood vessels wrapped around there. There's also axillary nerve that's in that region. So that's why the surgical neck is of clinical significance. The third branch you've got to know is right here. It's the biggest one. 
biggest branch, I should say, subscapular. <coughs> I get to make as many mistakes as I want because I get to grade, have to grade your exams. <laughs> oh, really. You're going to make me walk on water. I have to make you walk on water. And you don't want me to make you do that. Oh, man. <clears throat> By the way, I got your test. You get to see them. And a lot of you did good. Some of you, you could do better. And you'll get to review those today. I don't know if you can see those arrows. Oh, can you see them now? <clears throat> OK, well. That one's subscapular, posterior, anterior, circumflex, humeral. So I know that those are there. Therefore, which part of the axillary artery is it? First, second, or third? It's got to be the third part, because those branch off the third part of the axillary artery. Okay. So again, it's like, oh, what clues does the model give me? Yeah, question? Can you say those again? What did you say? Anterior, posterior, and subscapular? Subscapular. Okay. Posterior. Uh, anterior. Thank you. Now, this one here, I kind of put colored arrows past the latter board of the first rib. Now it's, uh, first it's subclavian. What do you call it now? The purple. Axillary, then the green is the brachial. So again, the artery's not changing. Just the names. So going back to that model, what I did was, well, how could I tell what's what? If that's the first rib cut, I put a big black line there, so I know I can call it subclavian. So after that first rib, now I can call it axillary. Because I knew this was the third part because of those branches, I just put a line there. So after the black line, now I can call it brachial. So that's kind of how you have to. Um, study it, figure out what clues you have, and you can kind of name it accordingly. So we talked about the arteries, and you want to talk about the veins of the upper limb. What I've done, that's my head. Uh, this causes confusion for students because it looks like super crazy busy. What you got to do is know that all of these blue tubes, they're all veins, and there's no arteries that run with them. These are all the veins that you can kind of see in your own forearms. And so let's talk about these superficial veins with no accompanying arteries. Here's a picture of it. There's only three. There's only three. So it's a phallic basilic medium tube. Now, the cephalic vein, I already mentioned it. Let's call these superficial veins of the upper limb. Now, the median cubital vein, that's the one for blood draw. So look for that one only in the ACF, the crick of the elbow. This one I already named. 
We talked about it in the deltopectoral groove earlier. And so you can see it up here. But it starts way down there, back of the hand, on the thumb side. So I don't know. That's kind of what I always do. I just think, OK, where's the thumb? And I just look for the blue blood vessel. It runs all the way up, all the way up, all the way up. Eventually, it's going to drain into the axillary vein. Okay. Here's bacillic on the medial aspect. It's going to start in the back of the hand on the pinky side. It's going to go all the way back there. That's bacillic. So cephalic laterally, bacillic medially. The two actually connect the median cubicle. So let's look at other pictures of the superficial veins here. There's the one in my hand. The thing about this picture is that's the thumb. That's the thumb. So these are um, not the same extremities. So if I see the thumb there, I'm looking at this big thing here. That's going to be cephalic. And this is bacillic on this side. And do you see where they connect? That's going to be the median cubital. So it's hard to teach from a picture of the model. It's better for you to study the model in the lab. Um, so those are the three veins you got to know. Uh, the brachial artery is um, easy to spot. It's right there in the uh, medial bicipital groove. I noted that before. But here's a dissected picture. Here's where it begins and where it ends. So brachial artery. Define that beginning. What did we say that was? The inferior border of what? Yes. Aries major. You guys are already getting it. You go an inch past the cubital fossa, the ACF, that's where it ends. Okay. So this is the medial aspect, there's the biceps brachii. Here's a picture of it, of a model we have in the room, so the brachial artery is right there. You would have to remove the forearm muscles to see where the brachial artery divides in the radial and ulna. So I put another picture here. The brachial artery divides in the radial and ulnar arteries. Um, Right there, you get an inch past the crick of the elbow, the brachial artery ends, work into the, um, well, look at these blood vessels there. The blood vessels are named after the bones. Radial. Our arteries named after the bones of the forearm. So if you can identify the bone, you can remember the name of the artery. I just always remember a thumb is like, hey, rad, radial. Uh, radial, ulnar, and that's pretty much it. There's arteries in the hand. I'm, I'm not going to teach that. But let's look at the cubital fossa, or antecubital fossa, a little more. There's the front of the elbow. You can even see the vein stick out, and I have it labeled there. Number four, that's the one I usually go for in this region, the median cubital vein. When you dissect it, you can kind of see it right there. There's the three you got to know in this region. Cephalic, bacillic, for blood draw, median cubital. If you do a dissection, those superficial veins have been cut. And I've labeled the muscles here for review. I won't ask you to identify them. I won't ask you to identify this artery. What do you think it is? Brachial. It is the brachial. It hasn't bifurcated yet, but you can kind of see it bifurcate right there. If you do another dissection, you remove some of the musculature. You can see right here where the brachial artery is going to divide into the radius and the ulnar arteries. 
So I put all three next to each other so you can compare them. If you follow the radial and ulnar arteries down to the distal forearm, look for them on this model. On this picture, um, the only clue you have, I'll tell you this is the thumb side. Therefore, which artery do you think that is? Radial artery on the thumb side, okay? Feel your pulse there. Ulnar artery. That's it. You get to the hand and we're done. So you got test Monday. And, uh, hopefully you'll be ready. When you come back from break, you'll just have time to study the models. Come back at uh, 10.15.